chapter 27 and Acts chapter 28 are two chapters I want to encourage you to become familiar with. And here we have the Apostle Paul on, who is about to get on a ship, on his way to Rome, to Italy. And he experiences some disruptions. Everybody say disruptions. There were plans scheduled. And at the very moment, you'll see in the text that the plans were scheduled, there was a storm also being scheduled. And at the moment, they begin to leave and push out into the water to get to the destination they had in mind. The storm sent them on a detour. Everybody say detour. How do you handle the detours? How do you respond to disruption? If no one told you, let me be the one to inform you. If you keep on breathing, at some point in your life, you're going to experience a disruption. If you keep on coming to church, you keep on living, keep on praying, keep on requesting from God. At some point in time, something is not going to work out the way that you intended. How do you respond when there is a disruption in your life? When you end up in a place that you never had any intentions on being. Some of us in Houston right now, but six months ago, that wasn't your plan. How do I handle the disruptions? When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, keep in mind, Paul it right now is in prison. He's in shackles. Everybody say shackles. When it was decided, decision, circle that, that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to the centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, was also with us. He, we left on a ship whose home port was Adramidium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops. Y'all see that circle scheduled. At ports along the coast of the province. But the next day, when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore and visit some friends so the friends could take care of his needs. And then we put out, the next day, we put out from sea, from there, we encountered <laughs> the moment they pushed out. We encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. Somebody say detour. detour. They made they had they had planned, they'd scheduled, there's a destination. I have planned. This is how by this age I'm gonna be married. By this age, I'm gonna be making this money. By this age, I'm gonna be living here. I'm gonna have my split lover home. By this age, I'm gonna be looking. Help me, somebody. 2012, 2016, or, or 2021, pandemic happened. Somebody say disruption. disruption. And now they pushed out from the port. They just got started. And as soon as they pushed out, they couldn't even get on the water good enough. And their headwind said, no, you're going to go another way. Watch this. It made it difficult to keep on. So, so we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the midland, the mainland, keeping to the open sea. We passed along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. That, that, that wasn't their plan, though. There, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy. OK, we got a ship that's going to get to Italy, so we're going to get you all from this ship, and we're going to put you on this ship, Paul, and the 276 prisoners that were with him. 
and the soldiers that also came with the centurion. They're now getting on this ship so they can get to Italy. Somebody say, my destination. destination. Watch this, verse 7. We made slow headway. We moved slower than expected. I thought I would be there by now. I I should have changed the message to that. That should have been the title. I, I thought I would have been there by now. Why have I not gotten to, you asked me to pray, I've been praying. But the Bible says they got on the ship to Italy because they're on their way to Rome, but it was slow, moving slow. Keep on reading, Isaac. For many days and had difficulty arriving at night as when the wind did not allow us to hold our course. The Bible says we sailed, we we made a detour. Somebody say detour. detour. They've already made a few different detours. What do you do when you have to deal with not just one detour? Now, I got one or two people in here who know what I'm talking about. Not just one detour. But it's every time I make plans, nothing works out the way I want to. How, how am I supposed to do this? My, I, one detour, another detour, another detour. Lord, what do you want me to do? I, 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 come, I come here all the way from Memphis, Tennessee to help you. How do I handle the deep? The, come on, God. It said we sailed. It said the wind would not allow us to hold our course, so we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite of Salmon. We moved along the coast. Are y'all listening to me? With difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Watch this. Don't, Don't miss this one. Much time had been lost. What happens when you waste the time in that relationship? Take your glasses off. What time? I mean, uh, you've been married, and you, by the third year, you saw somebody you never thought you. How did I marry? Oh, uh, so, 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 okay, all right. Much. Now, this Luke, the gospel according to Luke, he's writing this, and he's letting us know. We want, I want you to know that everybody on the ship collectively have come to the conclusion that we've wasted time. Has anybody ever felt like you wasted time? In my sanctified imagination, I believe a lot of people online are saying that they, they've wasted time doing something that you thought you were supposed to be doing. Keep on, keep on. I'm, I'm trying to build the case here. I know some people like me to just read and not have the ad lib, but I can't help it. I can't help it. I can't. Look, 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 look. And watch this. Much time, verse 9, but the text preaches itself, had been lost and Sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the day of atonement. So Paul, the only saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, he's on the ship. And after now having been on this water for so long, dealing with this delay and this detour, I could imagine that he got frustrated because that's the only reason why he would speak up. And so then he speaks up and this is what he says. Men, I warn you, I can discern that the voyage, the path that we are on is going, if the King James Version says, be filled with hurt. It's going to be disastrous and bring great loss, not only to the ship, not only to the stuff that you're carrying with you, but even to our lives. And this is what he says. Well, this is what happens next. Hey, y'all. We got to make some adjustments because I discern the rate we're going, we all going to die. And so one of the people who had power to make some decisions, look at what happens. But the centurion, somebody say but. But. Instead of listening to what Paul had to say, he followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship because they actually have experience to handle storms. And so he chose not to listen to Paul, but he listened to everyone else. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in that they were it, the Bible says majority of the people decided that we would sail on hoping to reach Phoenix. If you move on, 
to verse 18. Because they decided that now we're not going to listen to the word. We're going to listen to reason. And because the experts know, I'm going to listen to the experts. And so they decide, now you know what, we're going to leave from here because I'm in a rush now. And many times when we're in a rush, we submit to faulty thinking. Because you start looking at your clock. And you start looking at your plans. And so now you listen to people you shouldn't be listening to. And so they decided, Paul, I appreciate you. I've heard a lot that you did, but tell you what, shh, shh, we got to get to where we're going. And so now I want to be married so bad. Now I need that money so bad. Now I want to be affirmed by my mom, my dad is so bad. I'm going to make some faulty decisions that's going to run the risk of killing everybody. But watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Verse 18. We took such a violent, I'm fast forwarding. They're on the water. Soon they get back on the water. The Bible says that the wind was blowing softly and then abruptly it started going back hard. And so now they're in the middle of the storm, in the middle, in the middle of the water, in the middle of the storm. Look at what the text says. Verse 18. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day we began to throw cargo over. We, we got to lighten this ship up. And then it says, verse 19, on the third day, they threw tackle overboard. We got to get this ship light with their own hands. But then I love verse 20, and I'm going to wrap it up. When neither sun nor star, somebody say darkness. darkness. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up. Somebody say gave up. We gave up all the hope that we could be saved. After being gone a long time without food, Paul stood up. <laughs> he looked at the men. Men, you should have taken my advice. <laughs> have you ever been in a situation where you had the opportunity to come back and look at somebody in their face and say, well, you know, I... <laughs> Y'all know this is a set-up question because I know just about all of us have been in a situation where you can't, well, well you know, I told you. I, I should have called this, I told you so. <laughs> this is what he said. Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. Some of us are suffering unnecessarily because you move too quick. You're too impatient. You got to get to that destination. And so because you got to move on your own will and accord, that's why you suffered and you blaming it on God. That's why you suffered and you keep on reading, keep on reading, get through with the reading, get through with the reading. But now I urge you, keep up your courage. How do you have joy in the middle of a storm? Paul is telling them, I need you. I know it's dark. We've been on this water for 14 days nearly. It's been dark and we've been in the storm. No one has eaten, but he's telling them, I need you to be encouraged. How can you be encouraged when nothing you plan is going the way you expected? I'm talking, I need to talk to somebody. How do you be encouraged in the middle of the divorce? How do you be encouraged in the middle of heartbreak? How do you be encouraged in the middle of bankruptcy? How do you be encouraged when you lost someone? You, you, you know no one lives forever, but you lost your loved one. Paul says to them, but I need you to be encouraged because not one of you, now he begins to speak life over them, not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Some of us focusing more on the ship, the things then he says, let me explain to you why I'm telling you this. Last night, God visited me. Stood beside me. And this is what the angel of God said. Don't be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar, which is in Rome. And God has graciously given you the lives of all of those who sail with you. So keep 
This is what Paul says. So now, since I'm telling you God gave me a word, I'm giving you the word that God gave me. And so what I need you to do is believe the word that God gave me, that God is giving to you. Be encouraged. Nobody is going to lose their life. Then he says something to them that, uh, he he says, what I do know is we're going to have to wash up ashore on some island. I don't know what island it is. Hmm. For a moment, I want to talk from the subject. Your storm is on schedule. Look at your neighbor and say, your storm is on schedule. Look at somebody else and say, your storm is on schedule. Keep looking at that person until they look at you. They just look at it. No, look at them. If you need to just. They don't want to receive the prophecy. But you need to know whether you like it or not. There is a storm with your name on it. And when you woke up this morning, it was scheduled for you. Ah, see, you want to come to church and you want to hear God is good. You're going to live prosperous. You're going to get the house, the marriage, the relationship. God is going to do all these things for you, but you don't want me to tell you that there's a storm. I said, God, I, got, I, said, I, said, God I, I know we're about to go into a new series. Voices, well, what you want me to let them know right there today that there is a storm that has their name, that has a date, that has a time on it that belongs to them. Mm. You might want to write that down. And the moment I said... Your storm has been scheduled. The moment I said that, your storm is on schedule. Somebody said, well, well, well who scheduled it? <laughs> Somebody in this sanctuary, in your Holy Ghost field mind said, I hear you. But who scheduled the storm? I need to know, did God schedule this storm? I need to know, did the devil schedule? I had someone to email me. Well, I had someone on Instagram, one of my friends. She had sent this week, this week. That's why I knew it was affirmed that I needed to preach this message. She was like, I got a question. She put it out there for everybody, but she typed my name. So obviously she wanted me to respond. So I was like, all right. She was like, how do you know when God is testing your faith? Or if God is blocking something for you? Or if the devil is actually at work. <laughs> I made it simple. I, look, look, see? You ain't leaving here until you give me the answer. So, so you know me, I, I'm, looking on, I'm looking on the story and I'm like, well, let me see what everybody else said because I want to make, because she named some pretty, you know, Reputable people, so I want to see what everybody. Everybody has some really, really deep things of, of how to know these three different things. I was like, well, mine is particularly simple. If God is blocking something, or if God is testing your faith, why do they have to be two different things? Because when God blocks something. Nine times out of ten is going to test your faith to trust his blocking. But then I came back with this. Just because God is testing your faith, what makes you think that the devil is taking a vacation day? Can I help you? Where in your mind do you need to know who initiated the storm? Because when I look at this text, it's a possibility that God initiated the storm. He, he could have sent the storm. There's no indication of it, but it's possible. And it's possible that the devil initiated it. There's no evidence of that. But what there is evidence of 
is their faulty decision making caused them to wreck their ship while they were in the storm. So whether or not God initiates or sends the storm in your life, whether or not the devil initiates the storm that you're going through, or whether or not you're in a storm because of your own decisions, everything must flow from the sovereignty of God. Let me back it up. Let me help. Let me help. Let me say it again. Let me say it a different way. I know you want to know the answer. But you should behave the same no matter the storm. You want to know, but knowing, I want to know, Lord, I need to know, like, did, did, you, did you send this storm that I'm going through? Did, did the devil, is it because I, I, at the end of the day, if the devil initiated, God had to permit it. And if I'm in a storm because I chose prematurely, because I fell in love with the representative, and now I'm in this storm because I said I do, before I should have looked beyond the surface, God is still the same God. So my question to you is this. Either he is or either he ain't. I know it's not correct English, but it's correct English today. Either, this is the question that I was asked that I'm going to ask you whenever you're in a storm and you feel like you need to know all of the details. Either he is or either he ain't. Either God is sovereign or God is not sovereign. Because no matter if God sent this storm that we don't have any indication, no matter if the devil was behind it, God can use the storm to bring him glory. But either he is or either he ain't. I know I made a mistake. God is mad. He's going to leave me here. Either he is or either he ain't. I need to know, God, did you start this storm? Paul, Paul, Paul is on the ship. Let me give you context so you can appreciate what's happening in this text. Paul is on the ship on his way to Rome. When you look at Acts chapter 19, verse 21, after Paul was doing ministry in Ephesus, he healed the sick. He did everything that God called him to do. He debated all of the Greeks. That means the intellect, the people who were well learned. He's now there in Ephesus. He's wrapping up Ephesus. And now he must go through Achaia and Macedonia. But in verse 19, 21, it says, I need to leave here. I need to go through Achaia and Macedonia so I can get to Jerusalem so that I can ultimately get to Rome. Somebody say Rome. He knew, he was compelled in his spirit that God wanted him to end up in Rome. So he wanted to get to Rome and he got arrested. Y'all missed it. I need to get to Rome. I feel in my spirit I need to go to these few places and then I believe God is sending me to Rome and then he gets arrested. Let me try one more time. Maybe they'll catch it. I feel compelled in my spirit that I need to make these few stops, but I believe God is calling me to get to Jerusalem and then get to Rome. And then in chapter 23, something happens. 23 verse 11, something happens. He's in prison because the church became a mob. They didn't like the fact that he brought some Ephesian Christians into the church. And they said there are people Paul is bringing into the church who should not ever enter into the church because they don't look like us, they don't behave like us, and they're not perfect. We don't want those Ephesians, those people. The church was closing its doors because it felt that only certain people get to come to church. I, I, know, I know we never dealt with that, right? The church was closing its doors 
because they didn't approve of the type of people that Paul was allowing to come in. When did the theology of church that say you need to be clean before you ever enter? You need to be healed and whole before you ever enter. And so they got upset with Paul and the church, look at chapter 23 for your homework, became a mob and they rioted. Kill him, church folk, because he was bringing people to the church who they didn't approve of. Who was church for? Yeah. Yeah. The people who look like they deserve it? Or is it not for everyone? And so now, as a result, he's in prison because church, he didn't do anything wrong. And so now he's in shackles. And he had to go to Felix. And he had to appear before the king Felix and, and listen to what King Felix said. He had to argue his case. And then Felix retired and then Festus came and Festus, he had to argue his, his way to Festus. And Festus says, well, you know what? Nothing I can really do about it. He didn't really do anything bad. But, but he says, listen, I'm actually a Roman citizen. So I can't, because he knew he couldn't stay in Jerusalem. If he stayed in Jerusalem, he knew he was going to die. But he knew he had to get to Rome. Somebody say Rome. Wow. I'm going somewhere. And so he said, well, 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 Festus, hear this. Since I am a Roman citizen, I got to go to Rome so that I can actually argue my case. And according to law, they said, okay. And so now, Paul is on a ship to Rome. Somebody say Rome. Rome. My mentor said, date your purpose. No, he says, marry your purpose, but date the process. Somebody missing it. Date, he says, marry your purpose, but don't fall in love with the process. But what I like about Acts chapter 23, I think it's 11, Paul is in prison, and then God appears to him. And this is what, this is what God says, hey, thank you for testifying for me here in Jerusalem. Now I need you to go to Rome. So now he heard a word from God that I need you to go to Rome. But here is the thing. God is sending him to Rome, but didn't give him the details. God will send you somewhere, but you don't get to determine the mode of transportation. God will send you somewhere, but you don't get to control how he going to get you there. I'm going to Rome. God said I'm going to Rome. As a matter of fact, I was reading Romans chapter 1 verses 9 through 15 and something powerful happened there. Paul had never gotten to Rome before and he so badly wanted to get to Rome that he wrote them a letter and he had never gone there. And he says, I've been in verse 9, he says, I've been praying for you. Lord knows I've been praying for you day and night. In verse 10, he says something very powerful. One of the things I've always prayed for is the opportunity. Somebody say opportunity. God willing that I will be able to come and see you. Be careful what you ask for. Because he says to them, I need to come to you. I want to come to you. But then he, then he also tells them, I need you to know, though, that I, I tried to come many different times. But I was opposed. He didn't say why, who opposed me. He said, I wasn't able, I wasn't able to come. But I need you to see some, some, some more verses. Look at what it says in verse 11. I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to make you strong. That is, you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Verse 13, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, I plan many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you to see spiritual fruit. Verse 14, 15, for I have great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world. If you look in this original text, it says Greek and barbarians. He says, I feel called. I'm going to come. This is going, we're going to end the message there. I feel called to minister to the Greeks and the barbarians. Anybody who didn't speak Greek back then was considered a barbarian, who spoke an unfamiliar language. And so he said, and they were considered unlearned, untrained, 
uneducated. And so he says, I am not just called to the Greeks, but I'm called to the people who don't have any, 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 any money, who don't have any learn. He said, I'm called to the barbarians as well. This is important. And then he tells them, I'm eager to come to you in Rome. See, when you know your purpose, you move through storms differently. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, I need you to write that one down. I need you to, I need you to. When you know your purpose, storms come, but I think differently. Storms come, but I move differently. When things fall apart, I have an idea that they could be falling in place. When you know your purpose, somebody say, my storm is on schedule. And so I'm looking at this text. He is now on the way to Rome. But there are a few things that stand out to me. One, disrupted plans. Even Paul was like, yo, I get to go to Rome. I've been beaten, bones broken. I wasn't expecting that. I'm in shackles, but I'm on my way to Rome. I get to minister to those in Rome and then a storm comes. And even Paul's plans were disrupted because now he's not getting to where he expected when he expected and the people in the same ship is causing for a greater delay. Sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's the people around you. I'm trying to help you. Sometimes it's not the result of you, but it's the result of the people you're in covenant with. Sometimes it's not your fault. But how do you handle the storm? You know, I'm not here because of something I did. I'm here because of what they did. So now Paul is frustrated. Listen, y'all. If y'all keep on making those faulty decisions and thinking the way y'all thinking and trusting in y'all own experience and y'all own degrees and y'all own acumen and not the Lord's, we all going to die. So what I'm going to need y'all to do is I'm going to need y'all to make some better decisions. Nudge your neighbor and say, hey, you got to make some better decisions. But God, hallelujah, God is a God of disruption. And God gives us a gift called disruption. Sometimes he looks at our life and he says, I need to slow you down. But your slow down could be a setup. And sometimes I got to slow down because I'm moving too fast. I think I need, we got to stop at all of these. We got, we got, they had their whole plan. We're going to stop, we're going to stop. I got all these expectations and God ain't in none of them. I actually, for the other person, I made all these expectations. Now I gave it to God and said, bless it. That's like Acts chapter one, when Peter was like, hey, y'all, we're going to find us a new apostle to replace Judas. Y'all, let's go ahead and, 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 and cast some stones. And now we're going we, we got two people. OK, now we we're going to choose these two people and say, God, bless these two. One, one, bless my options. What if God don't want to bless your options? What if what God wants to do has nothing to do with the decisions that you gave him? Somebody say, my storm is on schedule. And so now Paul, his plans have gotten disrupted because I needed to get to Rome because I'm going to give the gospel to the barbarians and I want to give the gospel to the Greek and I need to get to Rome. But now I'm in a storm. Now I'm delayed and I'm, I'm afraid a little bit. Because if I wasn't afraid, God wouldn't have come and said, hey, don't be afraid. It's okay to be afraid in the storm. Don't let anybody tell you you should not lean into and embrace the fact that maybe I'm afraid and that's why I'm acting the way that I'm acting. And so he talks to them. That's the first thing you see. Another thing we see in the text I think is important is the outside chatter. The outside chatter. They're in the storm. And everybody is listening to people they don't need to be listening to. You now got the centurion listening to the sailors. And the sailors listening to the soldiers. 
And now they've all concluded, hey, you know what? We're just going to keep going. It makes sense. Keep in mind, the sailors have been on the water so they know how to navigate storms. They know sometimes you need to push through the storm. Hmm? But what Paul was saying, no, we don't need to push through the storm. We need to slow down and invite God into the storm. Paul told him, no, we need to chill. Let's slow down. Paul listened to God's word. They listened to man's reason. Mm, ah, ah. Be careful of the voices you listen to when you're in transition. Oh, I didn't tell y'all this. Paul ain't in a storm. Paul is in transition. Paul's trying to get from where he is to Rome. And that middle part is transition. Some of you have been calling it a storm, and God said, no, I'm just trying to transition you. You're focusing on the wrong thing. Paul is in transition, but when you are in transition, you got to be careful of the chatter that you choose to listen to. Everybody on this boat is going through a storm, but everybody in the boat ain't responding to the storm the same way. Let me say it this way. Everybody is going through the same storm. But everybody ain't going through the same storm the same way. All of us got a storm with a name on it. But everybody in here may go through our storm a different way. What do you mean? If you keep reading chapter 27, the sailors tried to act like they were pushing the lifeboat over. They, 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 were, they was putting down some, some anchors, but they were putting the lifeboat over because they was about to escape. They tried to leave everybody. Sometimes in your storms, some of us got a tendency to try to run away from our obligations, of our responsibilities. We just got to escape. Somebody say escape. Then you had the soldiers who wanted to kill everybody. Look at the latter part of the verses. The Bible says, they, they, and then the centurion had to step in and say, no, I don't need you to kill Paul. Mm-mm. Some of us, when things don't go our way, and we've been in darkness a little bit too long, everybody can get it. Everybody can get it. And you leaking on everybody. You go to work, you leak on them in the cubicle. You come home, you leak on everybody around you. Everybody knows what you're going through because when you go through the storm, you behave differently. Preach the message. Preach the, preach the message. Preach. When we're looking at this text, and then you have the centurion who is listening to the advice of people who claim to be experts. When you're in the storm, it doesn't matter if it's an expert, if it goes against the word of God. Because sometimes God's word will counter reason. Because sometimes God will ask you to do something in his word that is contrary to what experts told you you need to do. But be careful because sometimes fear would dress up as wisdom. To keep you from walking and taking a step of faith. So that's why you got, I'm in a storm. I, I'm in a transition. Ah, hold on, let me take this to God. Make sure that what you're saying and what God, Lord, I want to make sure that it's in alignment because I don't need to be making any false steps when I'm in a storm because it can cost me my life. Oh, somebody say, listen. Somebody say, listen. There was darkness. Somebody say darkness. I, 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 gotta, I, gotta, I gotta give this to you. They're in the darkness for two weeks, back and forth. The storm, it's like, it's like what you've been going through. You've been going through so long, and you just wonder, God, can you give me a breath? Like, everybody else seemed to be cool on IG. Everybody seemed to be good on threads. Well, why is it that it seems like I can't catch a break? It's just dark. And I'm looking at this text. You got those sailors. They're trusting in the lifeboat. And they're so focused on the lifeboat that they can't trust in the lifeguard. And sometimes when we go through our storms, 
we may not realize that God is sending us through a storm so we can learn how to release control over the things we need, we, we need to control. Your storm may be designed for you to learn how to release the need to be in control. The sailors, I have something that's going to do it. Because we always have that backup plan. You always have that backup plan. What you trust in more than God. Because that's the reason why I can't trust in God. Because I got something that I'm depending on more than I depend on God. And so I see that lifeboat over there. And that's why I can't listen to Paul. Because I saw that lifeboat and I know that I'm good. And it could be that there's a proverbial lifeboat in your life. Something you're trusting in, something you're believing in, something you talk to, someone you talk to before you talk to God. There's a proverbial light bulb. Your money, when you go to work, yeah, my salary good. I don't have to worry because I got, there's something that you could be trusting in more than you trust in God and what they had to do. When Paul saw it, he told him, if they leave this ship, we all going to die. And then the sailors cut the lifeboat cut the strings to the lifeboat and let the lifeboat go away. Somebody said release control. Release control. Mm, mm, mm. But watch the sequence of events. If you look at this, when you read it on your own time, it's so much, it's so much, it's so much. If you keep on reading, round about verse 30, they're still in a storm, but they got joy. They started eating because Paul said, hold, hold, listen, y'all ain't ate because y'all been stressing. Some of us, y'all need to stop scheduling your anxiety. You need to stop scheduling your panic. And the devil can't wait for God to send you in a storm because the devil already knows he just got to sit tight because as soon as God sends the storm, you're going to start panicking. You blaming the devil. The devil just sitting right here. Look at you panicking. The devil ain't did nothing. Watching you fall apart because you can't handle the storm. Look at the text. They started to have joy and they started to eat. And they started to listen to Paul, what God said through Paul. They got joy after they released control. They got to a point in the journey, in the storm, where they said, you know what? You give up. When they gave up, that was signifying they came to the end of themselves. And there's nothing else their expertise can do. Nothing else their degree could do. Nothing else the self-help book could do. Nothing else my coach could do. Nothing else my mama, my daddy could do. Nothing else my degree could do. And say they said, I... I give up. And when they said, when they lift their hands up, just you could, they just kept their hands up there. Lord, I give it to you. Some of us just need to do this. I'm letting it go. Somebody got it. Some, somebody got it. Somebody got it. I let it go. And when they let it go, and then Paul said, you need to start eating because you can't out pray a bad diet. And he says, I need you to eat. Y'all not fasting for the right reasons. Y'all fasting because of worry. Stop acting like you're doing that for God. You're doing that for your panic. You can pray all day, but your diet is bad. And so they listened to the right voices. And now they released control. Now daylight began to break. Look at the sequence of events. Daylight did not begin to break until you stop needing to be in control of your narrative. How long am I going to be in this storm? Have you invited God into it with you? Because if God is inside of the storm with you, it don't matter. Because when I was looking at the text, The angel appeared to Paul. Hey, you're not going to die. And because you on this ship, ain't nobody else going to die either. Some of y'all need to know it's because you in the building. Somebody need to know it's because you in the family. It's because of you. 
And he said, ain't, ain't nobody going to die. And that was it. Hold on, you ain't going to stop the storm? I mean, you ain't going to let it let up? I mean, can we get some day? They were moving in the dark. Your greatest transitions will always happen in the dark. When God is transitioning you to something greater, it's going to off, almost often happen when you can't see the next thing. That's what you call somebody say faith. faith. Somebody shout faith. faith. Your greatest faith moves happen when it's absolutely dark. And so now, I got other. So now, they release control. But then I'm looking at the mission. Somebody say mission. mission. Get this. They ended up shipwrecking on a place that even the sailors had never seen before. Get this. Seasoned sailors had no idea where they ended up. And when you turn over to chapter 28, the Bible says when they finally escaped to land, they discovered they were on an island called Malta. Somebody shout Malta. Malta is 17 miles long, 10 miles wide. It's small. You can't even find it on the map. And when you look in your own time and you read your word for your own self, it says it was a land of barbarians. Somebody see where I'm going. And it says the barbarians met us with unusual kindness. They didn't care that Paul had shackles. They didn't care that Paul came from prison. The Bible says that these barbarians, which meant they did not speak the language that everybody else spoke, which meant that they were isolated. They didn't know who Paul was, but they were barbarians. And then Paul, they were so shocked. You mean to tell them they love him? Was Then Paul goes, he's trying to help and serve, and so he goes and gets some some, some wood to start a fire. Yeah. And as he's putting that wood down, a viper, yeah. venomous, yeah. bites him on his hand. You mean to tell me it's cold out here. It's dark. I've been on the water for 14 days going through God knows what with people who don't know how to make sound decisions. I'm stressed. I'm shivering. I'm in the water. I finally make it to land. I don't know what these people are talking about because I don't speak their language. I've never been here before. No one has ever been to Malta before this encounter. And then Paul gets bit by a snake. Somebody say snake bite. And then it fastened to his hand. Which meant it didn't just go, but it hung on. Why didn't the snake just bite him on the leg? Because it's on the ground. Why didn't the snake just, you know, it had to bite him in the area of his greatest threat. His hands. Because those were the same hands. If you keep on reading your Bible, the Bible says... That Publius, who was the governor of the island, heard about how he handled his snake bite. Some people are just watching you to see how you handle those snakes in your life. And when Publius heard how he reacted when he got bit by the snake, maybe it's not venom, it was vaccination. Maybe it wasn't to kill him, it wasn't to prepare him. And so the Bible says that he shook it off. And the same people who indicted him and said, oh yeah, according to our gods, the God of justice is what they said. Our God of justice, because that viper stung, you know, you know bit him, he, he did something bad. But when they saw he didn't die, somebody said, I didn't die. I didn't die. Somebody said, I didn't die. Think about that thing. 
I didn't die. It didn't kill me. It did not kill me. By God's grace, it did not kill you. You're supposed to be dead and gone, but you're still here. That snake bite did not take you out. It did not kill you. I'm still here. And because he shook it and kept doing what he felt compelled and called to do. What is that? Not to just serve the Greeks, the learned, the educated who got money. But when he wrote to the Romans, he said, I am indebted. Look at your word. I am indebted. Romans chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. I'm indebted to the Greeks and the barbarians. Where are you going to find the barbarians? I don't know. But when God detours you, and when God sends you in a storm, don't be too quick to abort your storm. Don't abort your storm prematurely. Because God could be sending you to the one place that only he trusts you with. Because Peter, at this time in his life, was still a bigot. He only thought the gospel should go to the Jews. And the one person who felt like the gospel should go to everybody was This storm had nothing to do with Rome. This storm had nothing to do with Italy. With God needed to prove himself. This storm had everything to do with Malta. The place you didn't expect to be. Around people you didn't expect to be around. Uncomfortable, cold, living a way that you never thought you'd be living. Because God has you in a place that only he trusts you with. Somebody shout Malta. Malta. If I could tell you one thing, I would tell you this. Don't mishandle your Malta. If God wanted Paul to get to Rome, he would have just sent him straight to Rome. But God used the storm that maybe the devil initiated Paul used the mistakes of the sailors because they delayed and they got shipwrecked. God did all of it because he's sovereign. Because it was a place that he wanted Paul to be. There was a mission. Because when you take the time to discover God, who are you calling me to? Not what are you calling me to do? Maybe you will get the answer when you start thinking about who. Who are you calling me to? And then maybe what are you calling me to do now? And so now he's in Malta. And when Polybius calls him to his house, he discovers that Polybius' relative is dying. So what did Paul do? Paul healed the man who was sick. And when Paul used the same hands that God didn't bit because the devil thought he had you, he waited for the right time when you weren't expecting, when you got to the end of yourself, you've been going through for so long, and then that one betrayal, that'll do it. They're going to lose their mind on that because if they use their mind, Instead of losing their mind, the devil knows he's in trouble. But Paul said, I'm going to heal these people. I'm going to heal everybody in this land because I've been called to them. That's what the storm did for me. It's not did God send this storm? Did the devil initiate this storm, or I made so many bad mistakes that I'm going through a storm. 
Because everything flows from the sovereignty of our God. But the one thing that God wanted, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, he wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of him. And Paul, he used that opportunity to share the gospel with some people who would have never, ever received the gospel outside of him accidentally landing there. What are you willing to endure in order to get the gospel to people who need it and people who ain't heard it before? Lord, we thank you for what eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. Who are you sending us to? Who needs to hear the gospel because of me? Help me to shift my prism and perspective of why I'm going through this storm. Because God, no matter who sent the storm, all storms can be used to bring you glory. Lord, we thank you. I pray right now for that person who came to church today stuck, angry, going in circles, confused, and asked you to meet them. I pray, God, that this word is touching, has touched, and will touch the hearts of those who are listening right now. Do a miracle right now, God. We didn't just come to hear a good word, but we need food so that we can go out and implement what you have given us. This day, I pray, God, for every single soul who has not come into a saving knowledge of you. Help us to take this word, pack it up, put it in our lunchbox, take it to work, give it to somebody we know who needs it. Help us to be your word. Help us to do like Paul did while in the storm. He shared with the other people what your word said to him. So God, what you have already told us in your word, help us to do that and to share it with other people. God, we thank you because our storm is on schedule. But because our storm is on schedule, we invite you to walk in the storm with us. Abide with us as we abide in you and your word. According to John 15 and 7, he said, abide in me and my word in you. Whatever you ask, then it shall be done. Teach us to abide today in your word and allow you to abide in us. Let us not run away from the storm. Let us not be upset about the detour because your detour is leading us to a Malta, a place we did not expect to be, but a place that we get to do what you've called us to do. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone in this sanctuary shouted together, amen. Amen. Stand up, stand up all over God's house. Everybody stand up, stand up. Just as a reminder for everybody, if you have your children, you want to pick your children up first. If you need the transportation ministry, you want to remain in the sanctuary, there will be ministers who will give you direction as to when you can catch the shuttles. So again, pick up your children first. And then if you need the uh, shuttle service, you will remain in the sanctuary and uh, the ministers will give you direction as to um, when you need to exit to get on the shuttles. Uh, Those of you, you do not need the shuttle service. You're free to go as soon as uh, Isaac gives us the closing prayer. Let's thank God for the word, everybody. All right. God bless you. Thanks for coming. If you have not experienced Jesus Christ and the pardon of your, your sins, There is a number behind us that we encourage everybody online, no matter where you are around the world, and everyone within this sanctuary. It's nothing to be ashamed about, nothing to be embarrassed about, no matter how young, how old you are. 
If you have not encountered Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins or you're not sure, it's better to be certain. There's a number behind us. Please follow the instructions and someone will be in contact with you.